Hi and welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. Ash. I'm a doctor and a dentist in the UK. And what we have here is the essentials from all 13 modules of my panel and MMI interview course that you can find online. If it's your first time joining me, you can watch the entire playlist here where you have all the mini essential series. And if you want to unlock more videos like this, just hit subscribe here and turn on notifications to make sure you get told anytime I bring out a new video. So today we're looking at how to answer questions around medical ethics for your medical school interviews. Particularly, we'll be looking at capacity and consent. Again, just to remind you that this is a short summary series. So I'm just gonna give you the bare bones that you need to either go away and study yourself, or if you want to check out and, and go deeper into the subject, you can do so by looking at my online course which is linked in the comments below. So first let's define capacity and consent. Well consent is when somebody gives permission for something to happen. So in the context of medicine it's usually a patient giving permission for an investigation, an examination maybe, or a procedure. And when we talk about consent in medicine it's usually informed consent which I'll come on to define later. Then the thing we need to understand is capacity which is the patient's ability to give consent and that's usually determined by their understanding. So there is a piece of legislation that you should be aware of called the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 and that defines the four criteria which must be met for a patient to be deemed to have capacity. Those are that they must understand the information that's given to them, they must be able to retain that information, then number three they must be able to weigh up the risks and benefits of the thing that is proposed to them and finally they must be able to communicate that decision back to you. So if you want you can have a quick pause of this video and try and think of some situations where capacity might be compromised in a patient but I'm literally going to go through them right away if you don't want to wait. So situations where a patient's capacity could be compromised are either temporary, such as alcohol, drugs, acute mental illness, physical illness causing maybe a delirium, or if they have reduced consciousness, for example. Or there may be permanent situations where a patient's capacity is reduced, such as advanced dementia, maybe a traumatic brain injury, or if they have a learning difficulty. Then we have to consider what we do when a patient is deemed to not have capacity. Now again, I won't go into these in detail, but there are three things that you must be aware of when a patient lacks capacity. The first thing is what that we should do is act within the patient's best interests. The second, sometimes somebody is nominated as a medical proxy and that is a person who is pre-allocated to act on the person's behalf and make medical decisions for them. Or finally, we can have something called an advanced directive, which is a legal document that the patient, when sound of mind has said, in circumstances that say they lack capacity or where certain things were to happen, what wishes they have, or maybe who they would like to defer the decision-making process to. So one thing I'll talk briefly about is best interests, because it's hard to know exactly what's right for the patient and for that particular individual in that circumstance, what the best thing to do for them is. So we go on a lot of things. We go on the condition that they've got, the likely prognosis, how likely treatment is to be effective or the given thing that we're proposing, what the likely outcome of it being beneficial is. And it's really important to communicate with the people who know them, their close friends and family. They'll be the people who know their cultural background, their personality type, what they would typically want to have in a circumstance like this. So it's really important to have effective communication between the doctors and the relatives to establish actually what is the action that's deemed in that particular patient's best interest. And one last thing I would like to tell you about capacity is four core principles of capacity that you must know. The first is that a patient is always deemed to have capacity unless proven otherwise. The second is that just because they don't understand the first time doesn't mean they don't have the ability or the capacity to understand. It may mean that you just have to change the way you explain the thing that you're proposing or just use plainer English to get the message across. Third thing to note is that just because someone makes what is seen to be a poor decision does not mean that they lack capacity. And finally, the thing to note is that capacity is situation dependent. So we'll talk about child consent later, but for example, a child may, may be mature enough to understand what's involved in having their blood taken, but they may not understand the complexities of a big operation and not be able to have the capacity to consent to that. So as I said before, when we're talking about the medical context, it's not just consent, but informed consent that we need to gain from the patient. Now to gain informed consent, we must have five of the following things. So the first is that the patient must have capacity. The second is that they are able to weigh up the risks and benefits. It must be delivered in a way that they understand. 
they also need to have time to think about what's being proposed to them and be offered the chance to ask any questions. And it's really important that the doctor respects the patient's autonomy and doesn't coerce their decision in any way. So another element of consent is what if a patient withholds consent? Well, it's very important to know that a patient, if they are deemed to have capacity, they are allowed to withhold consent, even if that decision seems unwise. The thing that I would recommend that you do if you get asked or if this happens to you in real life is check that they've fully understood the consequences of what their actions are by withholding consent. But all you can do is remind them of that. And if they continue to withhold consent, then they are perfectly within their rights to do so. Now let's go on to talk a little bit about capacity and consent in children. Now there are two terms that you don't need to know a lot about, but you at least need to be sort of familiar with for interviews. So the first one is a term known as Gillick competence. And that states that a child is able to give consent if they are mature enough to understand it, have capacity to do so, and it's within their best interest. So to be deemed Gillick competent, this is similar to having capacity. They must understand the treatment, be aware of the risks and benefits, and understand what the alternatives are. And then if they meet all these criteria, they are deemed to be Gillick competent. Now, remember what I said before about situation specific, or well, this happens particularly in children who might understand what's involved in having their temperature taken, but may not understand more complex procedures, so can't give consent for that. But the important thing to realize about Gillick competence is if a child is deemed to be Gillick competent and it's in their best interest, their decision can't be all overruled if they give consent to go ahead with it. And in a minute, I'll talk about the opposite situation where a child refuses to give consent. But first, let's talk about the Fraser guidelines. And these are a set of guidelines aimed to help mainly GPs when treating under 16 year olds when it comes to matters of sexual health and contraception. So they state that basically, if a child comes in seeking sexual health advice or contraception advice, the GP is allowed to give them advice and treat them if they meet the following five criteria. So firstly, that the patient has the maturity to understand. Second, that the doctor can't, they're not allowed to coerce them, but they can't persuade them to involve their parents in the decision. Three is regarding contraception. Is the patient going to continue having sexual intercourse even if we don't give them the contraception four is would their mental or physical health suffer if we don't intervene for example if a patient potentially had an sti and if we left that untreated in a female that could lead to infertility for example and finally it has to be deemed to be within that patient's best interest to give that advice even without the parent's consent one other area to be aware of on this subject is safeguarding, and that is a system set in place to help protect vulnerable people. That can be adults, children, all sorts of people. Maybe they're suffering from a mental health problem. There are a variety of people who are deemed vulnerable. And this is to protect them from being abused. It could be psychological, physical, financial, sexual. And the thing to note is that we always have somebody who's responsible for safeguarding. In the hospital, it's a safeguarding lead or outside we have agencies, but it is your duty as a doctor that if you see somebody who is deemed vulnerable to report that to the appropriate safeguarding agent. So the final thing I want to touch on is what do we do when a child, even if they're deemed Gillick competent, refuses consent? Well, this is one interesting area because if a child, is, even if they're deemed Gillick competent and a treatment or an intervention of any sort is deemed in their best interest, then they're allowed to give consent, but they're actually not allowed to withhold consent. So that brings us to the end of this whistle stop tour of medical ethics and the questions that you'll get asked and how to answer them when it comes to your medical school interviews. So I'll wrap up with a quick summary and some tips. Capacity and consent issues come up often at interviews, so it's important that you know a bit about them and are comfortable having discussions about them. Like I say, if you want to go into more depth about that, I have a very long module on medical ethics on my online medical school interview course. Things to remember are the golden rule that an adult is deemed to have capacity unless proven otherwise. Remember that we assess their capacity by by their ability to understand, retain, weigh up the risks and benefits, and then communicate their decision about the intervention back to you. Remember that if a child is deemed Gillick competent, they are allowed to give consent to a procedure 
that is situational and also to remember that even if they are gillette competent they are not allowed to withhold consent from a procedure or intervention that is deemed within their best interest any conflicts within this get escalated can, and they can go all the way up to the court as say for example the case of charlie guard and again if you want more information about the medical ethics hot topics and important cases that you need to know about just head over to my online course where you can find all of those there fantastic so that brings us to the end of this whistle stop tour of medical ethics and how to answer questions on your mmi and panel interviews again you can check out the full playlist here for all the 13 modules and quick summaries you can find the link to the full course in the comments Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so that you can unlock further lessons from me. And with that said, I think we'll wrap up there. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the very next video.